I am. Yeah, I'm Martina. Emily, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. I want to make sure my mic's on. I don't think that they have <laughs> speakers on yet. Yeah, it should be fun. I'm going to leave a lot of time for discussion, so we'll get okay. through the presentation and then get into questions and stuff pretty quickly. Oops, sorry. So do you have a startup? I do. What are you working on? Uh, we're working on a messaging platform that has a built-in uh, text input method that makes it easier to type. Oh, cool. So we're trying to make it easier to just send messages. Mm -hmm. is, it sort of, is it like predictive text? Yep. And cool. It's got 10 big buttons. Acquire the input more accurate, which makes the error correction algorithms. Mm -hmm. The problem of predicting is easier, so mm -hmm. we can be more accurate. Mm -hmm. So it's and it's rolling along. No doubt about that. And yeah. Just hiring some people. And I haven't um, pitched it yet, but um, it's to the point like I just got like ten people working part time, mm -hmm. and so I'm to the point where. build a whole messaging platform and then figure out how to like sell ads and stuff like that or like we got a patent so we could license those that mm -hmm. would be the easiest thing to do mm -hmm. um, that might position you well
waiting for the high oh, sign. Yeah. Finding us, those of you who are new to Food Hall, and it can be kind of challenging at times. Thank you so much for coming, by the way. Um, I want to welcome you to Food Hall. For those who don't know, you are inside one of three incubators on the University of Washington campus that work with startups that are spin outs of the University of Washington and also startups that are not spin outs of the University of Washington. If you'd like to talk to us about incubation, uh, Fluke Hall that you're sitting in focuses on physical engineering startups because we have lab space. We also have Startup Hall over on Campus Parkway. And we also have HQ, which is over by the Trader Joe's, if you know where that is. And they focus on VR and AR. And we would love to talk to you about your startups. Uh, we would also like to talk to you about what's coming up here at Comotion Labs. Um, Next Tuesday and Thursday, we are working in partnership with Angel, uh, Seattle Angel Conference to do some things that tie in really nicely with what we're doing here today. Uh, today we have Martina Welkoff, and usually I talk to people beforehand, so <laughs> I, I've checked in about their pronunciation, so thank you. You for, got it. Thank you for that. Uh, she's going to be talking about pitching fundamentals and tying really nicely into that. Uh, next Tuesday over at Comotion HQ, that's the one over by the Trader Joe's, they are going to be doing Getting Ready to Take an Investment with Seattle Angel Conference, and that's from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, it's going to be a panel. It's moderated by Bill Bryant from DFJ, who's a, a local investor, uh, VC, really great guy to talk to. He knows everybody in town and is fantastic on the subject of venture capital. Uh, and then Thursday, uh, next week, also February 1st, there's going to be another one which is going to be pitch deconstruction, getting into the details of your pitch. So if you're hungry to find out about pitching and what happens after pitching, these are two great, uh, two great events. That one isn't at Comotion HQ, instead it's at the Riveter, which is a fantastic female-oriented space on Capitol Hill. Uh, which I recommend that you go and tour. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and that's going to be great as well um, with a number of different speakers talking about uh, how to do pitches and how to deconstruct pitches. Today, of course, we have Martina. Uh, Martina is a serial entrepreneur with growth and acquisition experience and a successful, and a successful exit. She is a founding partner of WXR Fund, a venture fund focused on women-led AR and VR companies, and a venture partner at Jump Cannon. Is it Canon? Mm -hmm. Okay. A San Francisco fund focused on uh, underrepresented founders and emerging tech. She's a board member of Seattle Angel and advisor to the Center for Leadership and Strategic Thinking at the University of Washington, which is right here. Mm -hmm. For over five years, she was the president of Seattle Women in Tech. Martina is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper, a member of the Young Entrepreneurs Council, and an alumna of the Schusterman Foundation Reality Program. And then after Martina's over today, we're going to also have uh, Newman Dean and Dan Goodman come in from the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic to talk about equity allocation. So we have like this whole theme running through today about uh, pitching and taking money and equity. And uh, we're going to start it off with somebody that we're very proud to host here. But stick with us and do, do all the things because we want you to be very, very successful. Thanks, Martina. Awesome. Thank you so much for that intro. Let me hop up here so the live stream can see me too. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today and hi to those of you in Spokane on the live stream. Uh, so before I get started, I just want to say I'm really excited about those announcements because I'm on the board of Seattle Angel, the, the governing body of Seattle Angel Conference. So I just wanted to endorse those Seattle Angel Conference activities. Very, very worthwhile, amazing group of people. I unfortunately won't be in town next week, but encourage you to check those out. And I work out of the Riveter, and it's an awesome space as well. So just wanted to plug those one more time. Uh, so I'm Martin Walkoff, and you heard a little bit of my background, but I want to give you a bit more context on who I am before I dive into the presentation. And then I'm going to leave a lot of time for discussion. Um, the presentation is pretty bare bones so that we can dive into your questions and really get at the topics you're most um, interested in. So be thinking of your questions, and we are going to leave plenty of time for that um, in the second half. So I founded my first startup uh, in 2010, and it was called Zealist. And we had three major pivots along the way. So we really ran what I consider three distinct businesses in the course of the six years that we were running Zealist. But where we ended up was a mobile gaming platform targeted at corporate employees that helped uh, employees to build relationships and learn about their company, and in turn um, fed data back to the employer on culture, morale, and engagement. 
And uh, interestingly enough, it is now pro property of the University of Washington. It's being run out of the um, Center for Leadership and Strategic Thinking at the Foster School. So I love UW, and I'm still very involved as an advisor there and on campus all the time, and uh, learned a tremendous amount through that process of um, running Zealous for six years and then also going through the whole exit process. And it was a really, really interesting um, journey. Um, I loved every moment, but it was also, of course, very challenging, as I know some of you in the room can relate to. So in the course of um, those six years, I pitched more times than I can count. So I have a lot of experience being in that position, and um, especially in the early days, feeling terrified and overwhelmed and awkward. And as I went on, feeling like I could do it in my sleep at a certain point because I had done it so much. And so kind of experienced the full spectrum of um, uh, experiences in, in pitching. And now I've switched to the other side of the table, and so I'm working with two funds out of California, both of which are um, focused on uh, supporting women and underrepresented founders. And my focus uh, right now is in virtual and augmented reality. However, um, I have a broader focus on emerging tech more generally, and I just love to hear about people working on interesting, fun startups and, and trying to help out where I can and provide some uh, feedback and advice. So um, I put together a little deck today that, as I mentioned, is very bare bones. So although we are talking about pitching, the deck is not a model of what a good deck should look like. I just want to give that little uh, caveat before I get started. And um, there's a lot of resources out there on what constitutes a great pitch. And um, I was just chatting with someone before we got started about how that's a good and a bad thing because on the one hand there's an abundant you know, source of information you can look at now, um, but sometimes it can be difficult to sift through the noise and not all sources are created equally, of course. And so I stole, I, I borrowed this list from Guy Kawasaki, um, and it's similar to, I, I looked at a few and I was, I was just trying to find a framework for our discussion today. And I chose this one because I, I, I liked how succinct it was, and I think it got at some of the points that I really wanted to discuss. Um, but the Alliance of Angels has an amazing resource for you. Um, you can just look up uh, Pitch Deck on their, on their website and they'll pop up um, their own resource that they put together. Just this morning, actually, someone sent me a resource that Docsend just published, and I haven't had a chance to do a deep dive, but what's interesting about that one is they've actually compiled it using the data that they have from the thousands and thousands of decks that they've had go through their um, service. So that's another interesting one to check out. Um, but, but a lot of them will have similarities to, to what you see here. This is the basic structure that most resources recommend um, for a pitch deck. And then of course it's going to be a little different depending on the story you want to tell and what you want to pitch, but there are some fundamental things I would recommend always including and that investors are going to be watching for as, um, as you pitch. So before we dive into this, I'm curious for those of you in the room, how many of you have pitched to investors, uh, have any experience? Okay, cool. So we've got a few, few with a bit of experience and um, a lot of you. So how many of you are planning to pitch, let's say, within the next six months? Is that goal? Okay, awesome. Great. Okay, so, of the, so there's um, a list of slides that uh, we rec recommend you include here. I'm just going to go over a couple today um, because there are some lessons learned that I, I've made mistakes in my pitches that I want you all to uh, avoid <laughs> so that can save you a little bit of time and also um, some things I've seen entrepreneurs do now that I'm looking at decks um, that I wanted to pass along. And then I'm skipping a few because um, value proposition and business model are really presentations unto themselves and are very unique to the whatever the business is that you're pitching. So happy to get into those topics in Q&A if you have specific questions there, but I'm gonna kind of skip over those. And then management team is a very, very important uh, slide, of course, but that's another one where it's gonna be very specific. Uh, one thing I'll say there is that you really, especially with early stage startups, which I think most of you are pretty early stage here, the team is probably, Aside from the idea itself and the technology that you're building, the team is the most important factor w that I look at when I'm thinking about an investment decision because with early stage, you're not going to have a ton of traction yet. You might have a little bit, which is great, but there's not, a, there's not a lot of data yet that an investor can look at to base that decision on in terms of how far you've gotten. And so what they're really going to be looking at is how much do I believe in this team and their ability to execute. So with that management slide, you want to just knock their socks off with how qualified you are and why you 
are the the people who are going to pull this off in, in a very competitive marketplace. So I just that's what I'll mention with the team, um, but we're not going to talk about that in too much depth. So. The problem and opportunity uh, is a really important slide, and this is actually this is where I see, um, and I, and I am uh, I have made this mistake in the past as well. I see entrepreneurs sort of gloss over this and uh, either launch right into their product because we're all excited to talk about our product and we all want to get to the solution and show off you know how smart we are and how unique our idea is, but in glossing over the problem, uh, you miss your chance for an emotional hook. And a lot of the time, you're going to have very limited time with investors, you know, especially if it's a pitch event or something like that, you might have as little as three to five minutes. And so you want to, the, the problem opportunity is your chance to convince everyone they should care and pay attention for the remainder of your presentation. And so the more relatable you can make this, the better. And if you have a group of investors uh, uh, you know, that you've had a chance to do some research on, which is the ideal, um, do look at their backgrounds, look at what they care about, and try to figure out how that translates to the problem you're solving. So uh, let's say it's a group of people who have experience in enterprise SaaS, and maybe you're not pitching an enterprise SaaS project, uh, uh, product, excuse me, but maybe there's some way you can relate the problem you're solving to a scenario they've experienced in the past. And that's really the best way to um, captivate your investor, is to make them personally understand your problem as much as possible. And you know, maybe sometimes that's not entirely possible, but if the, the best approximate, I would say, is to illustrate your problem with a story so that they can at least relate to the, the story that you're telling. And even if it's abstract, they can really wrap their mind around what that problem might feel like, or, or and also, by extension, what that opportunity is in terms of a market opportunity and the, the money that you can make there. So don't rush through the problem. Um, it's a very, very important part of your pitch. And it, it, if you miss the opportunity to, to draw those investors in, in this first um, slide, you might not get their attention the rest of the time. It might, you might miss the whole opportunity. And so really, really spend some time thinking about how to explain your problem and, and practice it a lot too. And this is advice in general about pitches, of course. But try it on a few different audiences before you're in front of investors and ask them, you know, how, how did you feel? Were you really drawn into what I was saying? Were you really interested from that first slide? If not, like, let's break it down and talk about what I could do differently to pull you in and to make you really excited to hear the rest. Um, another way to think about this and this is kind of pitch advice more generally, but I sometimes think of a pitch as, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the phenomenon of FOMO, fear of missing out, but you really want your investors to feel like this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is the investment they absolutely cannot miss out on. And so this is setting the stage for that. You, you want to explain to them why this problem is more important than any other problem. They're probably hearing dozens, if not hundreds, of pitches, depending on who you're pitching to. And so you need to, uh, prove that this is, this is priority number one, and if they miss out on this deal, they're going to regret it the rest of their lives. So kind of go at it from that um, mindset and, and really um, be confident in the value that you're bringing to them. So the underlying magic, and there's a lot of ways to think about this. This is the Ka Kawasaki um, uh, terminology here with underlying magic. But this is kind of the follow-up slide to that problem opportunity. And, um, and this can get at your team in some cases, um, especially if, let's say, you're, you're, I was actually just talking to someone this morning who is building a product for psychologists and they have a background in psychology, they are, they are a psychologist. And so in that case, it was really easy to illustrate why they have you know, the deepest knowledge of this problem. They are best positioned to um, execute on the solution. And so the underlying magic slide is really your chance to say, you know, maybe it's maybe it's your intellectual property that's the secret sauce. That's another term that's run around a lot. What's, what's the secret sauce? Um, maybe it's some kind of proprietary knowledge you have access to because of your network or because of your background. Or, but but try to figure out what is what is that piece that is so unique to you and your team um, that's really going to give you the competitive edge. That's really going to. Um, make you shine in a very, very uh, noisy and crowded marketplace. Um, so that's, and it could also be a great place for a demo or a visual. So if you if you have a product ready that um, is is really impressive. 
go ahead and show that and keep it keep it short if it is a demo. Um, but show off what you've created. Um, the I will caution you there though if your product's super super early. Um, I'm sure it's really cool and I'm sure it's functional and you're getting data, which is all great. But if you are going to show a visual or a demo, make sure it has that wow factor because this is another place where you might lose investors' attention otherwise. I've, I've seen quite a few decks and uh, my early decks probably um, reflected this as well where I was really proud of the product, um, but it was super early and from to an outside audience who wasn't familiar with all the sweat and love and tears we'd poured into it, Maybe it didn't look so impressive th in those early days. And so get some outside feedback on that as well, because we all love what we're building, um, but you want to kind of get some objective feedback on, when you look at this, does it make your eyes light up? When you see this, do you think, wow, that's something really original and valuable? Um, so, so again, rely on your kind of inner network of advisors and, and trusted um, people to, to give you that feedback before you put it in front of an investor. So your go-to-market. This is one where I made a ton of mistakes. And so um, this is really, really important. And now as I'm evaluating deals, I understand um, why it's so important. So the, the top mistake I see here and the one that I made early on is I picked a number off a Deloitte report for our, our market size. And it was a big billion dollar number. And I thought, oh, that's great. I'll show you. Now. This is a $4 billion market according to this Deloitte report. And I just put that on a slide and moved on. And because I was thinking, I just want to show them, you know, there's a lot of money to be made here. And that it's true. That is the goal. You want, you want to excite them about the market opportunity. But the problem with the approach I took, and I've seen a lot of entre other entrepreneurs take, is you don't necessarily just want to go for the biggest number you can find and the most reputable source <laughs> in the you know, footnote there. Because that's very, very surface level research. And in our case, that reflected you know, a, a large umbrella market, but we hadn't, we hadn't taken the time to do the segmentation and really break down, okay, in that $4, million, um, $4 billion number, what is our true addressable market and what assumptions are we using to figure out what that is? And that process is incredibly important because it shows investors that you're taking the time to be methodical and strategic, and it also shows them how you think. What are, you know, especially when you get to breaking down the assumptions, which you won't necessarily do during the pitch, but assuming it goes well and there's follow-up, that's when they're going to start picking apart, okay, let's, let's talk about the market. Let's talk about how you arrived at these figures. And so for the most part, you're going you're gonna to use your market research as a baseline to then build, to model out what your market really is. Um, in some cases, you may be able to find the magic number that actually pinpoints your addressable market. But in a lot of cases, you're going to have to generate that number. You're going to find the data through publicly available, reputable sources, and then, or maybe not publicly, you could potentially pay for some of that data as well. Um, but then you're going to do the work to prove that, that you understand the market, that you live and breathe the market. I mean, that's really what investors are looking for here. In addition to just proving that it's a viable opportunity they're excited about, they want to know that you have a very deep understanding and you've done a lot of thinking about what that market looks like. So competitive analysis. This is another one where uh, surface level research can really um, bite you because it's it, it's pretty easy to find you know Google a description of your product and see what other websites come up and see what other companies are sort of in your space but you want to have done your thorough research on those uh, companies you consider your competitors um, ideally you've even tried their products maybe talked to some of their sales reps um, you know, gone incognito and, and done um, thorough research so that you really understand what are their features, uh, what segment are they going after, is it adjacent, is, are they direct competitors, um, and be able to break that down in a visual way. And so that's the other trick here is there's a lot of information you have to get into a competitive slide and there's a few ways to do that. There's some kind of standard um, uh, charts you can use to convey that, but you don't want to just do the standard ours is the best, ours has all these features, and these guys only have these features, and move on. Because that's kind of surface level and also um, doesn't necessarily uh, get into, like, it's OK to show that someone is a direct competitor and maybe has a lot of the same features that you do, because there's different positioning. Maybe you're further ahead of them. Maybe you have IP that they don't have. Um, but all of, all of those things um, are really important to understand more than just, we have these four features and they only have two, so clearly we're the best. Um, and also, something that I've seen happen here is 
though there's two things actually. So one is people will say, we have no competitors because our idea is so original that there's no one else out there doing this or anything close to it. That's a bad sign to investors most of the time. Uh, by the way, I'll caveat everything that I'm saying with, there are exceptions, but I'd say, especially with this one, 99% of the time that's a bad sign. Because what that means is, or what that could signal is, there's no market. This isn't a real thing. Because if there was a market, other people would be doing at least similar things. There'd be some activity there. Having competitors is a good thing. Um, having a lot of competitors, maybe not such a good thing, but you want to have some competitors and you want to have an understanding of what activity is taking place in the market and how you can distinguish yourselves. Um, the other thing that I see happen there is um, after the presentations in the Q&A, an investor might ask a question and say, oh, well, have you heard of so-and-so? Because we're seeing a lot of deals. Sometimes we may have heard of a company you haven't heard of um, in your competitive space. And if that happens and you haven't heard of the company, say something along the lines of, no, I haven't. That's really interesting. Could you tell me more? Could we talk more about that? I'm going to do some research. Don't get defensive. I've seen so many entrepreneurs get defensive and, and either kind of try to make up something or just re you know, get really flustered by that. It's OK if you don't know everything. You know, it's, there's a lot of startups out there. Maybe you haven't seen every single one that's in your space. That's an opportunity for you to engage an investor and start to build that relationship and say, I would love to learn from you. Tell me more. Um, thank you so much for that information. So there's a way to handle that situation very graciously. It doesn't, it doesn't make you look bad. It doesn't make you look like you're not smart or um, that you're not on top of it because no one's going to know all, everything necessarily. And it's much better to um, to say thank you and kind of embrace that moment rather than, and I, I totally understand this. I've been there too. When you get a question, you're like, ah, I didn't know that. Or, but there, there's always a way to turn that into an opportunity to build a relationship. So just remember, and this is true of any question, just, just don't get defensive because um, that puts you in a really bad place in terms of the dynamic that you're building and also might shut down the opportunity for a relationship moving forward. Financials. Oh my, this is a fun one. So um, this is really challenging for an early stage startup. And I always, when I was building our financial models, especially in the early days, I got so frustrated with the exercise because I would, I just kept thinking, we don't know. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to figure this out. Like all of this is just make believe until we get out there and start selling and see what really happens. And so I, I got really, really frustrated with the, the process and I felt like it was a waste of time. And finally, one of our early investors sat me down and kind of gave me a very helpful lecture on how he also understands that these are made up numbers. This, this model isn't about projecting the future in, in a way that's necessarily going to be incredibly accurate. It's more about, again, the thought exercise and understanding what assumptions you are making about your market and about the way your product will perform. And so, and, and when I started thinking of it as a thought exercise instead of this steadfast plan of what our revenue would look like down to the penny month after month, it started actually to be more fun and more useful because then I could, I mean, a financial model is something you should continually revisit as you get more information. And the best models are very dynamic. And this is getting to the sort of actual, you know, spreadsheet and, and modeling tools that you're using. But um, you, you want to be able to walk through what, what your plan is in terms of selling and how that maps to the numbers that you're showing. Because if you, and I totally did this, so I just put a hockey stick up and called it good and said, yeah, we're clearly going to make lots of money and, you know, let's move on because I don't really care too much about this slide right now. And, and that, that was a disservice to my business and, and also um, really shut down, again, the opportunity for investors to dig deeper and ask questions and potentially help. I mean, a lot of your investors, whether they're angels or VCs, have a lot of experience in financial modeling and a lot of, they've seen a lot of projections. They might have access to some market data that you don't. And so um, if they push back, again, embrace that as an opportunity to say, I want to learn. Um, can you help me with that? I'd love to make this better. I'm always looking uh, to improve what, what I've done. Um, so financial modeling is something that never ends. And um, ideally, if you are out in the market, you are getting some traction, your model starts to map more and more closely to what is reality. But in the early days, before you've launched, before you really know 
how your product's going to perform and if anyone will pay for it. Um, it's still a very important thought exercise. And when I had that mental reframe, it helped me to invest a lot more time in it and understand the value. Um, it's, not, it's not so much about uh, the hockey stick necessarily. It's really about how you build whatever the shape of that graph ends up looking like. So those are the kind of key points I wanted to get through, because those are, I guess, some of the biggest mistakes I've made in my own pitches. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of other places we can go. And I know that you're at different stages here. And a few of you have experience pitching. A lot of you are thinking about pitching soon. So I want to make sure that the, the second half of our time is devoted to the pieces that will be most valuable to you. So I'm going to open it up for discussion. I'll go back to that first slide, too, if we want a little framework for these slides. Or feel free to ask questions that aren't covered here, too. Oh man, um, I really think the the getting very defensive thing is pretty bad. It gets pretty awkward pretty quickly, um, and yeah. So I think that's that's one of the worst and most avoidable. Like I think just going into a pitch, take a few deep breaths, do a short meditation, whatever you need to do to feel really centered and calm, and then hold on to that calm throughout the whole process. Because I think especially during the Q and A. I mean, investors have different styles, too. I tend to be a very, I mean, I've, I've pitched so many times. I have a lot of empathy for the, the person pitching. I'm not going to be a jerk. I, I usually you know, try to build rapport, and um, I'm pretty nice, I guess. But some investors have a different style, and they can be a little bit more harsh. They can. Some investors actually, I think, sometimes try to get a rise out of entrepreneurs. And, and to some extent, it's a test. It's a test of how you will respond to that and if you will be able to stay calm and stay centered and cool. Um, so just, yeah, as much as possible, don't get yourself in a highly emotional state because um, you're not going to be your best. You probably won't provide your best answers when you're in that kind of frenetic state. And uh, it'll turn off a lot of investors. Um, that, that may not, I mean, there probably are investors out there who like that. But I think for the most part, it doesn't, it doesn't serve you well. So um, keeping, keeping calm and cool is good to keep in mind. Yeah? Um, if you have like, more than one problem or opportunity, would you like, pick the best one and just? Um, if your business has more than like addresses more than one problem or opportunity, would you pick the best one and just focus on that, or would you try and do something where you show that there's two or three possibilities here? Yeah, great question. Um, so, in part, it depends on how much time you have, especially for the shorter pitches. I would definitely choose one and really zero in on that because you don't have much time to tell your story and you want to make sure you can cover all the important data points. But even if you have longer, I would usually choose just one and then put others in appendix slides. So it's great, or, or at the end, sort of when you talk about the bigger vision and where we could go. So especially if you know, those are really lucrative opportunities in addition or could lead to exits, or you know, that's kind of a nice way to tie together your presentation and say, so this is our phase one strategy. We have a really clear product roadmap. We know how we're going to get there. And we have all these other opportunities we're going to explore once we have that really solid foundation. So I kind of save that for the end, the icing on the cake. And that'll be great for opening up Q&A, too, because that kind of leaves them with a little like, ooh, the, and there's more. And you can get into it um, in the follow-up discussion. So that's how I would approach it. I think, was there another one over there? So my question is more along the lines of what's common for like a pitch schedule? Are there like these short, maybe five minute pitches that then lead to maybe like a more intimate conversation with the potential investors? And then on the second part, when do you start talking about equity and sort of the amount that you'd like from the investors? Sure. So it's pretty wide ranging in terms of the time and format. Um, with the Seattle Angel Conference, for example, there's a few rounds that you go through and the, to qualify for then the finals. And the first round is a three minute pitch. So you really, and that's the toughest one. I mean, when you, it's, it's just a little bit more than your elevator pitch, but not 
quite what you'd want for a full pitch. So I, I've seen, the range is usually, I guess, like three to 10 minutes. 10 minutes is generally the upper threshold for any kind of group pitch or um, event. Um, but there's also, um, this is not as relevant to what we just discussed, but a lot of the pitches I see um, and conversations I have don't happen in that kind of formal setting where the clock is running and you really have to <coughs> hit your mark and you know you might be on video and those kinds of things. Most of the pitches I see, I get a deck ahead of time and we schedule a call and I look at the deck, I come up with my questions and then walk through the deck together in a much more conversational manner. So a lot of the time, especially if you have relationships with investors already, um, whether they're angels or VCs, a lot of the time that's how you'll be pitching. And honestly, that's the way I prefer to pitch and to hear pitches because then you can really get to know each other. You can get to some of that um, deeper level information more quickly. Um, and I would say those kinds of contexts more often lead to investment. Um, to the other part of your question about equity. So usually when you're pitching, you should have an idea of what financial instrument you're using and what your round looks like. You should have all of that done ahead of time. And there might be some negotiation that then takes place. You know, That may or may not be what your round ultimately looks like, but you should come in with an understanding of what you're going for and be able to talk about that and, and be well-versed in you know, the plan and where you're at. Um, especially if you're working with institutional capital, um, there will be pushback and there will be negotiation you have to restructure. With angels, a lot of the time, as long as your documents are pretty standard, your round maps to market norms, you know that might end up being what it what it looks like. There might be less pushback. So um, that that will depend on the audience that you're speaking to, and, and whether um, it's pre-seed or uh, seed or a. You know, those are all going to look a little bit different, and the timeline will look really, really different too. I mean. We've all heard the stories of a round closing in a day at a coffee shop in Silicon Valley, and that can happen occasionally. Um, it's probably, for the most part, not going to happen. Um, but you know, sometimes it'll be a month, sometimes it'll be three months, sometimes it'll be six. It just really depends on where you are um, geographically, who you're talking to, and, and what your company is. You know, two years ago, VR companies were closing rounds super fast, and everyone it was the hot new thing. Everyone was really excited. Now there's a bit of market dis disillusionment. It's a lot harder to close a VR round today than it was two years ago. So a lot of it depends on your timing and kind of what investors are excited about in that moment. So really simple question. For title, should it be boring and static, <laughs> company name, pitch deck, et cetera, or should it be creative and draw attention to your audience. So this is where there's a, there's a lot of creative license to everything that, that we've just talked about. And I think that is a question about your brand. So I mean, it's totally fine to be boring with the title side. I think nine times out of 10, that's what I see. And that's fine. I, it's not, I, I don't penalize startups when it's just, I mean, in, in, you want to make sure that all the important information is there. So your name of your name of the CEO or whomever, whomever is presenting your company name, your contact info, that, that should be there because that is important information that investors are going to need to know. But if you want to get creative with it, if that's on brand and, and especially if you are, um, in, are you know, in media or building a product where storytelling is central to what you're creating, then start showing that off from, from the first moment. But if you're doing something that's like, a dev tool and your brand is much more technical and, and that you know the creative flourish isn't such an important part, don't force it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be clever. So that really just depends on your personal preference and brand, I would say. Uh, two questions. One's very in the weeds. I do a ton of presentations. I don't pitch very often. Uh -huh. uh, when I'm putting together a general presentation, I'm always very aware that human brains can't process language in uh -huh. two different places, so I'm trying to put as few words up on the screen as possible because nobody can listen to me while they're reading the screen. Uh, but a pitch deck is so dense with data, typically. Yeah. Is that something that you think about, or do you just wipe those rules away when you're, when you're making a pitch deck, because everybody's expecting it to be data-driven? Uh, and then question number two, I know this is totally subjective, but insofar as you can, when you're evaluating a team, which I see is one of the most important things to evaluate, are you looking mostly at their resume, or are you looking at, 
is this person calm and collected? Mm -hmm. Can they present well? Are they excited about their product? Uh, are you more on the resume side or more on the interpersonal? You know, is this somebody who can get a team and hold it together? Sure. So thank you so much for both those questions. Um, the first one was something I intended to cover, so thank you for reminding me. Um, so in terms of the um, slides themselves and visual versus words, and uh, the, the rules of best presentations definitely apply uh, when you're doing a live presentation. So as few words as possible, very visual, it's definitely the way you want to go. Um, but to your point about needing to include a lot of data, uh, usually what, what I did in the past when I was pitching and, and what I see often now is um, there's two versions of a deck. One that's a standalone, because most of the time as a, an investor, I get a deck ahead of time. I don't really do, I mean, I do sometimes do pitch events and things, but most of the deals I'm looking at really seriously happen in that more conversational style I mentioned. So what will usually happen is I get a standalone deck and there's either speaker notes or it's just a much more word heavy deck um, that explains everything I need to understand the pitch without someone actually telling it to me in person. And then we have the follow-up conversation back and forth. Um, but if you're doing a live pitch event, um, as few words as possible and very, very visual. And then what you can do with a lot of that data um, that you want to include but is too dense for the slide is put it in the appendix. And it's so, I cannot tell you how satisfying it is when you're in a Q&A and someone asks a question about the data and you can say, oh, well, if we go to appendix slide three, here you go, here's the, it's such a great feeling. So have that appendix slide ready and people are always, it's, it's a good, it's a good move. Um, so that's a great way of handling that in a live presentation to have the appendix ready to go. And to your second question, sorry. Um, so I tend to be, well, both is the short answer. Both are very important. Resume is, of course, really important. And um, you want to see that the team has the domain and technical expertise to pull off whatever it is they're trying to achieve. So that's, that's the baseline, I would say. You have to clear that bar in order to be taken seriously. And then, but the thing that then takes you even further is the interpersonal piece. So especially as a, a VC, um, I, we're pretty hands-on with our portfolio companies, so I want to know that we'll like working together. It's, it's not quite a co-founder relationship. It's not going to be that level of contact, of course. But still, there's, there's regular um, touch points. You, you want to collaborate. VCs, the best VCs add a lot of value to the companies they invest in beyond capital. So you want to know that um, you're going to get along, um, that there's not going to be a huge amount of friction, and also that the that person um, or the, the team that will be really leading the company forward is capable and is um, able to weather the ups and downs and storms ahead. So it is a huge red flag when you see someone have a really strong emotional reaction to a difficult question because then you think, well, what's going to happen when they're staring at their runway and worried about making payroll? If a question is hard, then that's going to be a much higher stress situation and, and you know, might question their ability to handle those kinds of problems. So, so yeah, the starting point is the resume, but then the interpersonal is, is really what I look at um, in terms of crossing the finish line. Um, like kind of following up on her question about the density of the deck, like <coughs> I've tried writing a couple of these and realize, you know, like it's always got too much information in it and then I just start stripping things out and then I realize like I almost seem to need to write the detailed deck first mm -hmm. and then write the pitch deck from the detailed deck mm -hmm. but then I'm kind of asking myself how many slides and how much information should I be including in the detailed deck like is that you know one by one match or could it be you know 20 slides or you know should it even be a report instead of a presentation format mm -hmm. So um, to the kind of first part about the creative process itself and how, so I think that's where um, having that trusted group of advisors to practice on first is going to be really helpful because you're so in it when you're building a company and building a deck that it, sometimes that can be a huge barrier to telling the story effectively. So I, I personally like to you know, get it all down in full detail and then get outside help to pick that apart and make it more succinct and easy to follow. And so the, the process piece, I think you really need to lean on people who are a little bit more removed than you are. And um, that feedback process is invaluable for making your deck um, strong for the general public. And then um, 
for, so were you talking about like with the standalone versus the presentation tech? So <laughs> I just learned a term this week actually, which I thought was really amusing, uh, sizzle deck. So there's this, I think it's more of a valley thing right now, and I don't know if anyone actually uses that term, just the person who was telling me about it did. But So there's this, this uh, trend in a lot of um, early investor conversations now to send a sizzle deck or a like two to three slide, just super, super succinct teaser of what your company is. And that's kind of used as an entry point to a bigger conversation. So there's a lot of stages you can think about. Everything from that two to three taste um, that will get your foot in the door and then you get to the bigger deck and then you may get to what I tend to think of as appendix level information. Um, so I'd break it down into those components and be able to tell your story in a lot of different ways. It's also really useful for if you are pitching in front of a lot of groups in different events, then you have sort of like your three minute, your five minute, your 10 minute all kind of broken down in different levels of detail you can go into. For a send ahead or standalone deck, I would never, I, I, you still want to keep it really succinct because even if uh, the investor you're um, reaching out to is really interested, they just don't have much time. So I'd still keep it to sort of this format and then put more information in the appendix if they do want to dig deeper. But I wouldn't send you know a 20 slide deck right out of the gate because they realistically might not have the time to look through that in depth. So you still want to be succinct even with the send ahead um, because you, you can't really count on having more than a few minutes of their attention ahead of the call. So you want to let make it really easy for them to get the key points. But yeah, I'm, I'm working on a sizzle deck right now, actually. It's kind of a fun, fun process. Um, so one other thing I'll mention in terms of events and timing, and if you do end up doing sort of public pitches like the Seattle Angel Conference, um, or like Techstars is really, really great at this and the, the coaching that they put all of their portfolio companies through. I cannot stress enough how important practicing is because if you are being timed, generally they'll be pretty strict about that time limit. And it's so sad when you see someone trying to rush all these final details in when they're kind of being pulled off the stage. And so just invest the time, spend a lot of time up front um, just practicing it again and again and making sure you're hitting every 15 second mark. Um, a great public speaking exercise that I went through a few years ago and is available to anyone here is Ignite. Um, this is not for a pitch specifically, but if you're just looking to get some more public, experience, public speaking experience and also uh, getting used to hitting uh, those 15 second marks. Uh, it's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a format where you have five minutes uh, to tell a story, any story, and the slides automatically advance every 20 seconds. So if you're off pace, it, it doesn't work. So you really have to um, have everything thoroughly memorized and timed ahead of time. And um, that, for me, was one of the hardest. I didn't pitch my company at that. That's not really what the format is about. But it was one of the harder um, public speaking engagements I've done. But it was so great for me in terms of improving my pitches because I got really used to uh, having to map to a really close time limit. And so just make sure you do invest that ahead of time because that's also, I mean, it's not necessarily like catastrophic, but it's just a bummer if you, if you know, if you only have a few minutes and you don't get to say everything that you want to say or, you know, things, the, the timing doesn't line up that much. So um, that's just a, a bit of feedback on pre prepping. I mean, just in general, um, spending a lot of time on the front end before you get in front of investors will potentially really accelerate your round. Sometimes it can feel like a distraction when you want to be working on product, you want to be in the trenches with your team, you know, just getting out there and getting to customers, which is what you should be doing, by the way, if you're bootstrapping. So don't, don't take time away from that unless you, you are getting uh, ready to pitch. But when you are going out to raise a round, um, invest that time early on in perfecting your pitch and um, keeping cool and staying calm so that hopefully your round will go a lot faster and you'll actually have more time to spend on product after that because you won't have to spend as much time talking to a ton of investors. So I don't know if, oh, really. I love when there's someone who has lots of questions. It's great. Um, seeing as you're on the investor end right now, I, you could probably answer this like, um, What's your thoughts on a pitch deck that just talks about users and traction but doesn't have a clear plan for monetization? 
Um, so it, that's kind of tough to answer in the abstract because in some cases that's that's okay. I mean, it depends on what the the bigger vision is. So uh, you know, there there are certain instances where that's not a bad thing. However, more and more uh, investors are expecting to see monetization plan. Like ten years ago, that probably would have been okay, and particularly in the valley, maybe less so in Seattle. Um, but now I wouldn't, I, I, you need to have at least some sense of what you're going to try. Investors understand that your plan for monetization may or may not play out, but you do need to have an understanding of at least how you're going to try to turn this into a real business because for the most part these days, y users aren't a business. And again, there might be, there are a few exceptions, but there are fewer and fewer um, as advertising becomes a really difficult source of revenue and so um, yeah you want to you want to think about and you might have a few I mean it's totally fine to say we're gonna experiment with a few uh, ideas for monetization you may not have uh, the plan figured out and in some ways that's almost better to see that you have like two or three ways you're gonna try to monetize and then you kind of have a backup if something doesn't work out but I would have um, at least something you're gonna try um, and then again investors might have um, some ideas too. You know, you and I <laughs> were talking, I kind of got right to, oh, have you thought of this? And I, so uh, investors love to think through those things too and contribute their ideas. So um, I wouldn't, wouldn't be offended by that either. It's not that in, in most cases investors aren't trying to, you know, say, why didn't you think of this? Or I'm smarter than you. It's just we see a lot of these things and we might have a different perspective to offer. Um, so come in with at least one, if not a couple of ideas, and then also be open to that feedback that maybe an investor will have an idea for monetization too. I realize this goes a little bit beyond uh, the original content of your, of your, of your talk, but um, as an investor yourself, when people get intro to you to, to make their pitch, is there a form of intro that you're more receptive to? Do, is it more, do you tend to get more um, people introducing other people to you or just emails out of the blue or what and what what should people be doing when they're trying to address an investor for the first time yeah so um, when I switched over to the investor side of the equation one of the promises I made to myself having spent a lot of time on, as an entrepreneur was that I was going to be as accessible as possible and really really open to any introduction and any conversation and it was very humbling very early on to realize that wasn't totally feasible just because of volume. Um, and neither of the funds I'm working with are even super, super public yet, but there's still a lot of inbound that happens. So ways that you can stand out, and, and I say that because I used to, if I had reached, if I reached out to an investor I read an article about or something and they didn't get back to me, I took it really personally and I was really frustrated and angry and I now realize it's, it had nothing to do with me. They just get a lot of emails and a lot of <laughs> clutter, and so it, it can be hard to sift through that a lot of the time. So that's my first thing. If you don't get a response to some kind of cold outreach, please don't take it too personally. Um, but so for me, the best way is a personal intro, um, and particularly if uh, the person connecting us is someone I really trust, their judgment and um, you know, it, the kind of closer in the network, the better in that in that sense, and uh, also that they've done their research. So that that the person I'm being intro to has done their research, and also the person connecting us. So, you know, for me, I'm really into VR, AR. I um, invest mostly in women and minorities. I have, you know, there's specific parameters I'm looking for most of the time. So if if the intro includes something like, oh, there's this amazing woman who's doing this awesome AR product, product, I know that that's your thing, um, then I'm really excited immediately, you know, that, that, that they've connected the dots for me. Um, the weaker intros are, <laughs> I get emails sometimes from people I maybe don't know as well that say things like, I met this awesome entrepreneur, can I make an intro? <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, can you tell me a little more? And, and, and even in those instances, if it isn't a good fit, I try whenever possible to point them in a the direction of either a person or a place that might be a better resource for them. But the more information you can provide up front, and again, like I said, connect the dots for the investor so they don't have to try to figure out why um, you're reaching out to them specifically is, is really helpful. Um, I do respond to cold outreach when, like an, a LinkedIn note, for example, I just got one this morning that was very specific, again, to 
a speaking engagement I'm doing next week, and this person wrote, you know, I can't be there, but I read your bio, and I really want to talk to you because of X, Y, and Z, and it, it made a lot of sense. Like I, and so I responded and said, yes, let's set up a call. Uh, that sounds great. And so if you, are doing, if you can't find that point of common connection, um, the second best thing then is if you do cold outreach, have a very detailed note as to why you want to talk and specifically what you're asking for. So is it a 30 minute uh, call or 15 minute even? Make the ask as small as possible initially to open the door for a bigger relationship. So a 15 minute call to give feedback on my product idea or you know, just, just very discreet, um, as, as small of a lift initially as possible will make it a lot more likely that um, you'll get a response. So that's, that's a strategy I'd recommend. And, and also, I mean, <laughs> don't ever um, shy away from tracking people down at events too. I was doing a pitch um, sort of speed dating thing a few months ago and I was just super burnt out because I had seen like 40 pitches in a row, three minutes each. It, I, it's a tough format <laughs> for an investor because it's hard to keep everyone straight and not really enough time to get into anything too meaty. So anyway, I was burnt out. I was like fleeing this event because I just needed to go home and cuddle my dogs. And this guy kind of chased me out and he was like, I really, really want to pitch you. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I don't have any more juice in me. I like send me an email. And, but he said, but I'm building something that I know you're gonna love because it involves VR and dogs. And I was like, it was almost a little, I was like, wow, you've really done your research to a level that I'm really, <laughs> but, but also I am intrigued. And so I did carve out a few extra minutes to talk to him and you know, we've had several follow-up meetings and stuff. So, so if you have some kind of hook, if you know there's someone you wanna talk to at an event, do not be afraid to be bold. I've heard some great stories too about people tracking down investors and doing crazy things. I mean, you don't want to invade their privacy. You don't want to get too aggressive. But you know, it's it's okay to be a little bit bold. And and um, if you do it in the right way, people usually respond pretty well to that. Is there another question up here? Um, if if you get rejected at a pitch, how do you tactfully react um, so that you could potentially pitch to that person again with a different product? Great question. Um, well, so there's a lot of ways you can be rejected, first of all, which is sort of interesting. Um, oftentimes, uh, people are afraid to burn bridges. They, a, a lot of investors don't necessarily say an outright no. They'll say, it's not the right time, so follow up with me. And, that is a form of rejection on the one hand because often oftentimes what that really means is I'm really not that interested but I'm I want to be nice so I'm not going to say an outright no and the unfortunate thing about that is it can end up wasting entrepreneurs time um, but sometimes it really does mean no I want to stay in touch and so if you hear that from me it means I genuinely do want to see more traction I won't say that to a company that I'm not interested in having some kind of uh, follow-up with in in three or six months, something like that. But so, so keep that in mind if you get that kind of soft rejection that depending on who it's coming from, it might mean they're not really interested or uh, that they do want to stay in touch. And that's a judgment call on your part. But I say that because I don't want, something that I did was waste a lot of time following up and following up with, with people who are never really interested to begin with. So come up with a system for that on your own. Um, but let's say you just get an outright no, we're not interested. Ideally, they give you some kind of reason. The best rejections have some kind of feedback that you can either um, incorporate to make your pitch stronger um, or just really understand. I mean, sometimes it's just our fund doesn't invest in this. And then you just know it's a clear reason. You have closure. You can check that one off your list and move on. Um, the, the best way to respond is, you know, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope we can stay in touch. And, it's important to keep in mind that these are very long-term relationships. You don't know how things are going to play out. You might find another company in the future that does fall into their wheelhouse. And so um, I've even done things like uh, there were a couple of VCs in the Valley who um, rejected us, but they did it in a way that made me feel really like they, they offered a lot of value. Their feedback was great. I enjoyed the process. There were no bad feelings. And so I referred other entrepreneurs to them. And the first time I did it to this one person in particular I'm thinking about, I could tell he was really, he was like, oh, wow, thanks, yeah. And that, so, so it's okay to you know, continue a relationship even if the investment is a no. If you know enough about them as an investor and you see another opportunity they might um, be interested in, send them a note and say, can I make this intro? And you may never hear back, 
Maybe you will and they'll be excited or maybe they'll say, no, I don't think that's a good fit. But either way, it's a long game. It's a long-term relationship. And the more you can sort of, if you find someone who you think is values aligned and you like their communication style, you like their investment philosophy, stay in touch. And um, in really lightweight ways, just make sure that you're, they're reminded of your existence from time to time. Um, and try to offer value when you do that too. So whether it's you know a resource that you came across or a company that you know that you want to connect them to, like some think of a creative way that you're not always necessarily asking for something, but you're saying, here, here's a little, a little something to brighten your day or make your job a little easier. Those are um, the best ways to keep someone engaged and interested. You mentioned uh, being familiar with metrics that a given investor or group of investors expect. What would you advise uh, for a company involved in biomedical or something very capital intensive, uh -huh. long term, where ultimately it's a lot of money to get it to market. Yeah. But if you know you're talking to a group of investors that are usually in a smaller scale, is there a way to bridge that or, or do you kind of scale the ask like a certain milestone that's within there? Yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough one, you honestly. Summarize yes, summarize yeah. So the question, the question was about, um, you know, the, the advice to map your metrics to what investors will expect. But if you're talking to a group of investors who aren't necessarily familiar with your space and the magnitude of investment required, such as a biomedical company needing uh, more capital uh, to, get, to get off the ground. So, I'd say ideally you are talking to investors who get it. And, and I know that's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but truly, I mean, in the best case scenario, you find those investors who do understand what it will take because it's a much heavier lift to convince investors of something that they don't understand and that they're probably afraid of, honestly. I mean, every investor has a different um, risk threshold and in different spaces they're more comfortable with than the other. So if, you're, if you are having to explain an entire market from scratch and the reasons that you know, your valuation and your um, time scale might look a lot different than what they're used to, you're kind of, you're, you're starting w way behind where you want to be, really. Um, so ideally, you, f you do research and find those investors who will get it a little bit more quickly. And then, and then you use the research just to demonstrate you know your stuff. And they, they can kind of ask questions that are specific to um, your, your market because they understand it already. Um, if, if you don't have any other options and, and you really are just looking for that bit of funding to get going, I'd look for people who have very high risk tolerance and who are really, and this is true in VR, by the way, too. So, there are very few investors right now who are familiar with VR, and so uh, it's hard to target uh, pitches. And you know, there there just aren't that many of us who have that as a special focus. So I'd say the way that we build coalitions when we're thinking about um, filling out a round is looking for those investors who shoot from the hip a little bit more and are willing to take those risks and are willing to think outside of the box. So if you if you can't find the market expertise, I'd look for the right personality profile that is like more likely than others to take that kind of leap. I think we're just up on time, so. Yeah, thanks, this is fun. Great questions too, thank you. Awesome, thanks. Um, and uh, if anybody didn't notice when you signed in, um, if you would like to get the deck, because the deck seems especially useful, uh, feel free to stop by here and mark that you want a copy of the deck. My deck that is a very poor example of a good deck, though. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We, um, we're going to move on to the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. For those who don't know, uh, the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic is here at the University of Washington. I'm going to talk over while they switch out the deck real quick. Um, uh, the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic is here at the University of Washington at the School of Law. You have uh, a new company and you want to get some free legal advice, you can go over and sign up for the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic and go through the screening process. And then you will be with student so attorneys, uh, student attorneys in training, who will be supervised by attorneys in the field of entrepreneurial law. So if they have a question the that students? they can't answer, it's not going to be students are going to be on their own. They're going to go to their supervisor and train discuss it. So I'll do some legal research for you. It's a great way to help them out. It's a great way to help yourself out for an extremely low or no cost. <laughs> So we recommend it.
The mic works. Um, so we have today uh, Newman Dean and Dan Goodman from the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. They're going to be talking about equity mm -hmm. allocation. Uh, so if you're thinking about equity splits in your company, this is going to be a great presentation. So please stick with us. Uh, if you would like to, we still have a little bit of food back there. You can grab a snack while we're changing things out, although it looks like we're good. And they've cleared out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, equity is not a huge issue at all. <laughs> uh, it is. Do you want to wait for the people to get yeah, to, we, to, 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 to start or wait for a minute? Or? Right, sure, okay. Great. Yeah, uh, well, for those of you who are still here, my name is Dan Goodman. I'm Numan Dean. And we're going to talk about equity allocation. Uh, we're with the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. So as, uh, again, another shameless plug, if you feel like you have um, any legal issues that uh, uh, need to be resolved, uh, go ahead and apply. And um, if you meet some of the parameters in the application process, then uh, we may be able to take you on board and to help you out. So, um. And uh, also joining us, we have uh, Deirdre Madsen. She's our supervising attorney. She's uh, at Perkins Coie downtown. Make sure we don't say anything incorrect. Okay. Great. So, uh, let's get this out of the way real quick. Is just a disclaimer that anything we say today is not shouldn't be construed as legal advice. We would like you to actually talk to a, your own lawyer if you want to do any of these things. But uh, we also have a link for the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. We are taking new clients for next quarter. So, if uh, you're interested at all, we can uh, talk about that after the presentation. So to give a kind of a broad overview of what we're going to talk about, we're first going to talk about the types of financing available to companies um, with a specific emphasis on equity. So the first thing that we'll discuss is what is equity. Um, and then the next aspect is going to be who receives equity. And we've outlined some of the specific players, or the typical players, pardon me, who generally receive equity, um, ranging all the way from founders to other individuals that you may not have actually considered. So what is equity? Uh, equity is, it, it can be defined in many different ways, but in the business context, equity represents ownership of a company. Um, and this is evidenced through things called stock uh, or shares. So if you are a stockholder or a shareholder, you are a interest holder in a company. Um, <clears throat> Let me think here. So it provides certain rights to an individual, um, and that can be profits um, through dividends, um, gain on an, uh, an exit event, um, and then of course uh, there's also voting rights for business decisions, and then in addition it can also be transferred or sold to third parties. Now I should put a caveat there too that securities are subject to the securities uh, regulations and the laws, and so the transferability of a share uh, may be restricted. Um, not only by law, but also possibly by um, a restricted stock purchase agreement. And I just want to emphasize the fact that uh, throughout the rest of this presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, equity in the context of corporations specifically. Uh, we will have a section on LLCs and partnerships towards the end, but anything that we say between now and when we specifically start talking about LLCs, you should know that's for corporations only. So generally speaking, and I mean generally, there are four different types of ways that a company can raise capital uh, to pursue its business endeavors. Uh, first is debt. So this can be done through a loan or a bond. So in the case of a loan, you go to a bank, you apply for a loan, uh, you may have to personally guarantee it, you may have to pledge collateral, um, and then that way you uh, obtain funding or capital to actually continue your business operations or even start. Um, the next way would be a, uh, 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 a bond. And so when a corporation issues a bond, it's basically an IOU that, hey, you give me this money and I'll give you some interest payments and then when the bond matures, I'll pay you back the principal. Now there's pros and cons to debt. Uh, the pro is that you're not giving away any ownership in the company at all. Uh, the bad part is, though, is that it doesn't matter whether the company's having a good day or a bad day. When those interest payments are due, they are due. And when the principal amount is due, it is due. Um, so keep that in mind. Another, actually, another pro, too, is that the interest expense for the company are tax deductible. So that's an above-the-line deduction, which can be uh, pretty, uh, 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 pretty good. 
Um, the next is going to be equity. So there's two different types, generally speaking. There's common stock. Common stock, when you think of stock on the market, we're generally referring to common stock. It's the foundational stock of the company. Uh, typically, uh, it's given voting rights. Um, there's usually rights in terms of profits, as I had previously mentioned, through dividends. Um, they also get to make, uh, they're the ones that make the major decisions, or at least the voting on the major decisions of the board of directors. Um, and then now we next move to preferred stock. Preferred stock is, again, preferred to that of common shares. Um, they, depending on the arrangement and how you negotiate the issuance of these shares, um, they can be cumulative or non-cumulative. And what I mean by that is that if the company issues or declares a dividend, uh, if it's cumulative and they don't have enough to satisfy whatever fixed amount um, that should be allocated towards the preferred shareholders, they participate in arrears, meaning that the next call that they make for a dividend, they have to satisfy the dividends for the preferred shareholders before they do the common. Um, or they could be non-participating, where that's just completely out the window, or sorry, non-cumulative. Uh, the other aspect is possibly uh, preferred, meaning so that they participate in the growth of the company as well. So there could be a percentage attached to that. Um, pros of equity is uh, it's you know it's it's pretty generally it's a common way of obtaining financing and capital um, relatively pretty quickly. There's a lot of hurdles that you'll need to do at the startup. There's a lot of contractual agreements, um, but giving away ownership is generally not uh, the the uh, it's, it's pretty common. Um, the cons, again, though, is that you're giving away equity in the company, which you may not be wanting to give away any ownership in your baby. And as uh, Dan mentioned earlier in the last slide, uh, whenever you're giving away equity, you want to keep in mind the fact that you're giving away securities. So you want to make sure that ideally you would talk to a lawyer, just make sure that you're not doing this uh, casually. You know, it's, uh, there are a lot of legal implications going on beyond the fact that you're giving away control of your company. And also, I neglected to say this at the beginning of the presentation, we do have a section for questions and answers at the end. But if any of you have any questions or need us to clarify anything, just stop us, let us know, because we want to make sure you understand what, what we're actually talking about. Uh, so debt and equity are the going to be the most common types of financing options. Uh, more uh, unique, I think, is the uh, convertible debt option, uh, which is essentially you would take a loan from an investor and the loan, the loan agreement would have provisions in place where if the company does well, the amount of the loan would then be converted to an equivalent amount of stock. So uh, let's say they loan you a million dollars up front and then you get to a financing round up ahead. Now they have the right to get a million dollars worth of your shares. Uh, and in order to take on the risk, they're gonna want a discount as well. So depending on how, far you, how early on you are and how far out you are from actually getting financed, uh, the discount rate could be anywhere from like 10% to maybe 30%. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's a good option if um, for investors who they're not too sure if the company is going to succeed as well as they think, as the founders think it will, uh, and they just want to have that loan option to fall back in case they don't get to a financing round. Uh, it's similar to this is the, is safe. It's the uh, simple agreement for future equity. Uh, it's put online by uh, Y Combinator, if any of you have heard of that. Uh, they have an example document there for free. It's available for free to take a look at. It's it's a similar to convertible debt. I'd say it's a simpler version of, well, yeah, simple. Uh, it's a simpler version of the convertible debt option because, yeah, yeah, go ahead. People finish your, I have a question about convertible debt when you finish. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, basically it's almost an agreement to agree later to the valuation. So if Founders don't want to put a valuation cap on the company and say, this is what our stock, our company is worth, this is what our stock's worth now. You can still sign the simple agreement, and in the future, when it comes to the financing rounds, then that would be negotiated at a different point in time, what the stock's actually worth. Yeah, your question? So with convertible debt, that starts as a loan, and then it's paid back, it's either equity or the loan in payment, or is it always paid back as equity? No. So, so the question for those listening was, uh, how basically how is the convertible debt paid back? Is it an option, either or, uh, or is it one or the other? And it is one or the other. So essentially, the way it's going to work is, you you take the loan initially, and then once you get to a financing round, the uh, the investor is going to basically take equity. The only reason they would take it as a loan with interest payments is going to be if the company fails and they still want their money back with interest. So the decision is the investors, not the company. True. 
So the convertible debt, the, the conversion feature of the debt confers to the investor the right, but not the obligation, to convert the debt instrument into common shares uh, of, of the company. So, and then the ratio as to what it converts into is negotiable, um, but it's, it's debt until it's converted. So once they trigger that, then conversion comes in. Now in exchange for uh, the debt instrument, they satisfy that, they get shares of the company. O only if it if they choose to take it as debt, I believe. Is that correct? If it's outstanding, yeah, there's interest payments. Sure. Yeah. So I think just to clarify a few points, with the note, it is drafted as a note, and so there's a fixed maturity date, and there's interest accruing until that date. And then a lot of these points are negotiable, but the way it can convert is there's a financing event. Um, sometimes the and that triggers the right to convert. And so the note holder can usually elect per the terms of the note to convert and it may convert, they may have a choice about, depending on what the note says, converting into the new round or converting into the last series based on a fixed, they're fixed like the, based on the terms of the note. So a lot of times it does include a discount. Um, but once that maturity date hits too, the company can pay back the debt it can elect to pay it back, but sometimes that's a negotiation because it isn't, they are investors. Usually people who sign convertible promissory notes are already stockholders in your company and they're, you know, they see that you're growing, they want to provide additional capital, but you're not ready to do a round. And so that conversation about, you know, does the company repay the convertible promissory note or have them convert or delay the maturity date is kind of a conversation you have with the investors at the time. Thank you. And I think a good way to think about equity in the company, uh, this is kind of what Dan and I have been told in class, is uh, you're essentially giving away rights to economics and control, money and power in your company in different ways. So uh, above all else, just make sure you do it carefully. So again, uh, now we're going to talk about the different ways, the different parties who are going to receive equity in the most common situations and the, the way that relationship will kind of work going forward. So we have obviously the founders, uh, they're going to get quite a bit of equity up front. There's going to be employees, there's reasons for that. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware investors, obviously are going to ask for equity. Advisors, uh, Dan will talk about that a bit more uh, later on, but uh, some companies will have advisors who are helping the company out and they're going to take a small percentage of equity and not listed here, um, but there's a, usually the board of directors will take a very small chunk of equity as well. And we'll talk about that later in more detail. So the uh, founders, um, the first thing I think any founder should do even before starting the company is talk about how equity is going to be allocated. I think that's very important at the outset to kind of figure out who's going to own how much of the company, what rights are they going to have. And I, I think it also very important is to figure out what roles everyone's going to play going forward. I think it, at the beginning when everyone's enthusiastic, it's very easy to say that, uh, you know, it's all going to go great and we're just going to figure things out as we go along. I think before you start putting money into the company and start making decisions of who's going to own what and who's going to do what, uh, having a very frank conversation with each other about their contributions and what they're going to contribute upfront and also going forward uh, is important to figure out how equity is going to be allocated. I, it's not a good idea to just say, oh, well, they've been with us uh, from the beginning, but they've not contributed anything, uh, so we're just going to give them an equal proportion of our shares just to be nice. Um, that's not necessarily a rational decision, and I think investors would also not look upon that too kindly when they're asking, okay, why does this person own 25% of the company that I'm now going to have to pay millions of dollars for? What have they done? So having that ability to justify why they own it and what they're contributing to the company going forward is important. Uh, I don't think your lawyer will necessarily be a part of the initial conversation, but once you've come to an agreement, it's good to talk to them to just kind of iron out the details, make sure that you haven't missed anything on that end. Uh, so when it comes to the founders getting the equity, and we're going to talk about vesting in a bit, but normally it'll be the shares that are authorized for the company are priced so low that you're going to put in a very nominal cash contribution to acquire your shares. Uh, now these shares, 
if there's multiple founders, could be subject to a restricted stock purchase agreement, or sometimes it's called a founder stock purchase agreement. Uh, and basically what that means is uh, you have the right to the shares in the future, but you don't get all the shares up front. And the reason for doing this is that when it comes to talking to investors, and they want to know that you're going to stay around for the long haul. So having this agreement in place means that the founders are incentivized to stick around, but then also they're restricted on what they can do with the stock initially. So we don't want any of you to start a company, take on some equity, and then just start giving it out to all your friends and family. And investors don't want that either. Because when you give out equity to someone, they're a shareholder in the company. They have certain rights in the company. That could be voting rights, money rights, control rights, whatever. Uh, investors really probably don't like that, and you might not like it either when you have a uh, family relative who's telling you how to run the company, uh, who ha also has legal rights and, you know, um, you owe duties to them specifically on how you run things. And investors will also, and we'll talk about this more, is they'll look and see who owns what, and they, they want to make sure that the other investors and anyone you give equity to is a co-owner of the company, essentially. They want to make sure that the owners are people that they like to work with. And you probably want to make sure that they're people you like to work with, too. You don't want uh, equity going to someone you don't like or someone else handing it out to someone you wouldn't get along with. So if the founders are going to invest on a schedule, at the outset, there's 100% of the equity. If the founders don't have it all, who's got it? So, so we'll, we'll specifically, oh, sorry, the question was about the founders get all the equity at the outset. If they have all of it, who's got the rest? Well, no. well the question oh. is if the founders are going to invest in, yes. that means they don't have all of the equity at the outset because, or is it just designated? So it'll, yes. Yeah, so the, um, the way that it works is initially the, when you start the, uh, the, the corporation in this case, you'll authorize all the shares and the, um, there'll be an example of this later with a capitalization table demonstrating the percentages, but the shares will be authorized and allocated to the founders. The founders won't necessarily own the shares personally themselves, but it's there for them specifically, and it'll vest to them over time or whatever conditions, and Dan will get into this in a bit. Uh, the, the key with the restricted stock purchase agreement is more what happens when the founders have the shares. So if you're starting a company with someone else, you want to make sure that uh, they hold on to it and stick around. You don't want them suddenly leaving you, but they own 25% of the company, and now all your hard work, they own 25% of it without having, without having to do anything. So the purpose is just to make sure that the stock uh, doesn't just go to you for free, that people have to stick around. And there's different ways it can be negotiated. Uh, that's, again, a question for an, like an attorney to go over with you, how you want to do that. But I think it's just important to make sure that you don't just give away the stock uh, to the founders without any considerations of the fact that they might leave later or they might give it to someone that you wouldn't want to work with. Or you know, whatever. There's a lot of different situations that might arise, so just having this in place makes sure that you avoid those situations in the first place. Uh, and so this brings to the third point is document everything with regards to equ equity uh, and keep the documents. Uh, it's not only helpful for you to see who owns what and what rights they have, but if you're going to seek investors, that's the first thing that you're going to ask is, okay, who else owns this? Who else owns what? And what does that look like? So we'll go into the specifics of uh, at a high level of what that looks like, but initially just make sure that you keep track of everything and keep paper records as much as possible. Um, and I will say on this point, there was something I was going back to. It. I'll remember it in a bit. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll come back to it. So vesting, what is vesting? Vesting is the idea of uh, instead of just giving all the stock up front, you issue it to the individual on a deferred basis, right? Um, and this could be based on, so you, you create a schedule, and this could be based on timelines, or it could be um, contingent on the happening of an event. So you know the company meets a milestone within profits or growth or whatever that may be. And then at that period, uh, you know, increments of stock based on the negotiation or the agreement um, ends up vesting within the founder, um, uh, him or herself. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, Manuel, about the type of vesting, like common type that you see within the industry. Um, why vest? Well, uh, Numan had already touched upon this. 
Um, first, it provides uh, incentive for you know, founders, and this also goes towards employees, key employees, to actually stick around. Um, and in turn, that provides security to the investors, uh, knowing that you're going to stick around. Because realistically, if you're investing in a company, especially at the early stages, I mean, you believe in the company, right? But they're really investing in the founders and the key employees. They're the ones that are going to make the company move forward. So at the outset, they're really investing as you or you and the founders or the key employees as individuals. Of course, they believe in the company, um, but you're the ones that are going to make it happen at the beginning. Um, so VCs will generally require some sort of a vesting schedule and how that schedule is uh, uh, negotiated in terms of you know, how much stock is vested when and what, ty what type of contingency, um, you know, that's, that's up for negotiation. Um, and then unvested stock, I think that might touch on your question about well, what happens, they don't own all the stock. If it's, the agreement should be drafted carefully and to make sure that it actually calls for this, um, but there's something called reverse dilution. So if you have, if you leave the company, you're a key employee or you're a founder, and you leave the company halfway through and you, your stock has invested completely, the rest of those unvested shares are therefore forfeited by you, and then they go back to the company, so you don't get them. So at that point, you, you keep what you have, but the rest of it, no, that, it goes right back to the company. So the way uh, vesting works can vary quite a bit. Uh, the most common is you just have a cliff vesting schedule. I think it's in industry standard is it's a four year period of time where after one year, 25% vests immediately. Then over the next three years, the remainder, set, the remaining 75% uh, vests proportionate each month. So that's the industry standard right now. Um, after four years, it's fully vested. And the reason for this is you don't want someone coming in and getting anything for their first year and not really doing anything uh, to earn it. Uh, after the first year of work, then they get a return on their work. And over time, they continue to get it, provided that they stick with the company. So this just kind of incentivizes them to stick around more than anything else, just to stay with the company. Uh, now, it can be tied to meeting other goals and conditions. Um, I think this is a bit more rare than just having it based on a time schedule, uh, but that might look like oh, um, meeting certain performance milestones for the company or the company itself hitting certain valuations or bringing in certain revenue. Um, now I've got a point here on accelerated triggers, and what that means is that if a certain event occurs, the remaining unvested stock or a proportion of that unvested stock vests instantly. Um, We'll, s we'll see this more in the case of employees. Uh, it's, I don't think it's unheard of to have founders um, have triggers, but um, an example of this would be, so a single trigger, uh, if the company is sold, anyone's unvested stock vests in instantly, so that allows them to actually participate in the fact that the company is sold and is now making money, and they might not necessarily have the same role that they had before. This is a bit more rare, I think, just because it's very generous to the, the person who's got the unvested stock to have it suddenly vest all at once just from the sale of the company. Uh, I think a more realistic option is the double trigger. And the most common way to have that structured is that two conditions have to be met. The first is that there's an involuntary termination of the employee at some point, and there's a sale of the company. So that would be, a, um, say, the company is bought by, is acquired by someone else, and they decide, we don't need these employees anymore, or we don't want this founder anymore, we're going to fire you then since both of those conditions have been met, uh, the founder gets to keep at least their unvested stock, so they're not completely losing out on everything. And so having the accelerated triggers in addition to the vesting schedule just protects the, the person who's got that unvested stock uh, from losing out on everything because of events outside of their control. And uh, oh, just a note on the double trigger, it doesn't have to be um, in order, so we don't want to see companies who would uh, fire all their employees beforehand and then then sell the company so that they don't have to give them the vested stock. So generally, I think it's about a 12-month period beforehand. Um, that's all subject to negotiation, but that's the overall structure of what it would look like. The 83B election. Taxes are always, should always be a consideration when you're talking about stock. Um, and so what Basically, what is the election? The election is that the individual is taxed at the time of grant as opposed to vesting. So if you're on a vesting schedule, when they grant you the stock, you pay what the value is right up front as opposed to when the stock vests. 
uh, at the periods. And that can be a really beneficial thing, and I've highlighted that in the next slide, but um, uh, and it's just a second here. But why do it? Again, at the outset, the, the stock theoretically is worth really, really almost nothing. Um, usually, you, you'll see stock valued at 0 0.00001 cents per share. Um, and then, of course, you know, as you obtain additional financing, you start, the company starts growing, you know, the value of the share starts to increase. Um, now, when to make the election? You have to make the election 30 days, uh, within 30 days of the grant. That's very important. If you don't make the election, you lose it, period. Um, and just to kind of highlight on the next slide here, here's kind of to, to highlight the disparity here. So um, Karen is a founder of ABC Inc. She has allocated one million shares of ABC uh, that will completely vest in one year. So she's got a tax rate of 30%. Um, and at the beginning, when they formed the company, the company was worth uh, 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 0 .01, sorry, 0 0.01 cents. And of course, um, it will vest uh, pardon me, one year from grant, it'll vest then, and then at that point, the value was worth two bucks. So if you talk about paying taxes on the value of the shares at the time of grant as opposed to when it vests, if the, if the valuation at the beginning is really low, she's going to be paying $3,000 in taxes, where let's say the next thing you know, the stock jumps up to $2 a share when it vests. Now she's got to pay taxes on $2 million worth of the shares that she owns, which is extraordinarily high at this point. So it's something that you should always be taking and well, take into consideration is, I mean, obviously, you know, the company ideally is going to grow. Um, and so you want to pay the lower tax bite than the higher tax bite. I mean, it just makes sense financially to do so. Um, but again, make sure that you file that 83B election within 30 days of grant, because again, I cannot emphasize this enough. If you don't do it, there's, there's no makeups, there's no go backsies. So this is the individual themselves. So whether it be the founder, the employee, whoever is the recipient of this of the stock is going to be filing it. The company doesn't do it for them. So employees, I don't think I need to go too in depth in explaining why this is important. Obviously a great incentive to make sure that the employee's financial gain is tied to the company's financial gain. Uh, it's very important, I think, for key employees specifically. There might be a tendency to like, oh, we, we give every employee a stock option. I think more importantly for key employees just to keep them, you know, to stay around and also to continue to perform well is to make sure that they have uh, equity. Um, now this can be done in two different ways. Uh, you can give them stock directly, you can give it to them. Um, I think more common is stock options where the employee's given the option essentially to buy the stock at a discounted price. Usually it's a discounted price. Um, the price is set beforehand and then at the time they can decide whether or not they want to pay the money for the stock. It's usually better for them. Uh, and I think that's more common is stock options rather than giving employees stock. Um, and again, the same vesting requirements that were applicable to founders, you can make applicable to employees. And I think it's more important with employees, specifically uh, key employees who are contributing uh, a lot to the team to make sure that they stick, ar stick around and uh, perform as well as you hope that they do. And I think one important thing to note here is the fact that you need to set aside an option pool for the employee stock options. You can't just give them the options without setting aside this pool. And I'll show you how that looks mechanically later on. But basically, if you have two founders and they want to take 50-50 split initially, that's fine. They own 50% each. But to start up this, the option pool, now you need to set aside a percentage that the founders don't touch at all. The company maintains this, and it goes to the employees. Uh, so then that would, say, look like 20% of the company is for an option pool and then the founders each own 40%, 40%. So just keep in mind the fact that you can't just give away stock options without authorizing the share specifically for the employees. Uh, and again, the securities restrictions apply, so don't just give away stock options without consideration for that, please. Um, I don't think there's too much different here. I mean, the slides are identical. There's probably different situations that might occur uh, for employees. The triggers, the accelerated triggers become a bit more relevant in this case, I think specifically with the, the double trigger. Uh, the, is very likely you'll be 
hiring very talented people who don't want to lose all their stock because you sold the company and then fired them. Um, so just be aware of the fact that you have the option to implement a double trigger. And it doesn't have to be all their shares. You can do a proportion of their shares and negotiate that at a later time. Um, but it just provides a way to sweeten the deal of the fact that, yes, they're going to get equity. Uh, they have to wait, but they're not at risk of losing it all if something happens to them. So should be pretty clear by now that investors will may actually be willing to give you money in exchange for equity. Um, <clears throat> typically, they'll want, uh, when we going back to the idea of preferred stock, um, they're not going to want common stock. They're going to want preferred stock. They're going to want to have rights that are uh, superior to others uh, when it comes to liquidation rights, voting, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's something that you'll negotiate with the investors um, at the time when you know they're you're talking about possible financing. Um, some of them will want to take a a more of an active role than others. Some will just kind of give you money and they'll take the shares and they'll let you do what you want to do. Others, so VCs for instance, may require um, that uh, they they get a seat on the board in order to oversee their investment. Um, you know, to make sure that things are running smoothly. They also may require some other protections, um, such as a veto, for instance, for business decisions. Um, so that should be something that's uh, uh, taken into consideration. And I think I also have here a right of first refusal, so that if um, somebody ends up wanting to sell shares and it's, it's okay based on the, uh, the restricted stock purchase agreement, then they'll say, okay, well, then we get first dibs on buying any stock, right? So then they can maintain uh, their equity stake in the company so then they're not diluted or so on and so forth. So just understand that when they, you give up equity to an investor, um, you know, they may want to be a lot more hands-on than the average investor, um, specifically in the terms of VCs. They're gonna want more rights uh, to protect their investment and they may want a larger management role than individuals who would hold common stock. That's something to take into consideration. And the terms and as to what that looks like, again, is negotiable. Um, so you, when you start talking to these VCs, they may say, well, we'll, we'll give you a million dollars or $500,000 or whatever it may be, um, but these are the things that they want. And that's, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all thing. Every investor is looking for certain things, um, and so it can run the entire gamut as to what those agreements would look like. And just to put a plug for uh, two weeks from now, I think there's going to be a presentation specifically just on Series A financings. Oh. Uh, also, other ELC students, if you guys are interested, I think uh, they'll talk a lot more, uh, they'll provide a lot more detail on how that works and what that process looks like. So, okay, so this is the fun stuff. This is the capitalization table. Um, so this is how, this is all the numbers behind everything. So who owns what, how much they own. Uh, you'll notice that in the second column, shares, um, are not in percentages, that's the absolute number. When you're given stock, you don't get a percentage of stock. The contract doesn't say, I'm gonna give you 20% of the stock. It's gonna be a, a specific number of shares. So always keep that in mind. You're not gonna give away a percentage of stock in any agreement. It's gonna be a number of shares, uh, and that stays constant. So if more shares are authorized to be given to someone else, your shares don't increase, so you're gonna be, proportionally, you're gonna have a smaller ownership. I'll show you in the next slide. So just keep that in mind, the fact that even though you keep the same number of shares, you don't keep the same number of ownership over time unless you're buying more shares or being given more shares. Uh, so what, uh, you'll notice the headers, they say pre-money, that just means before investors have funded the company. Uh, it was pre-money and post-money. Uh, so you can see, here's an example, very simple, straightforward cap table. Um, founders own 85%, option pull for employees, uh, 15%. 15% to 20% is usually pretty standard, I would say. Um, and now we'll see what happens when the investors contribute $5 million to the company. So there we go. So you'll notice that the, uh, the founder shares stayed the same, the option pool stayed the same size, but their percentages were halved because the investors put up $5 million, which is how much the company was worth before. So now the company is worth $10 million because it got an extra $5 million of cash but the proportional ownership's gone down uh, by half for everyone before. And the investors now own 50% of the company. Uh, so they're probably good investors, I hope, for the, for the founders. But just kind of an example of how it might look. Uh, so 
all the shares that the investors have were newly authorized as part of the deal. So they didn't exist before, but as part of the financing, uh, the company issued more shares, gave them straight to the investors for the $5 million. Um, and then the total number of shares have now gone up. Uh, they've doubled. And uh, you'll note that the option pool is decreased in size. It's now half the size it was before. Uh, investors might negotiate with you to have the option pool stay the same size. So they might say, well, we don't want the option pool to be 7.5% afterwards because we don't think you'll be able to maintain uh, enough equity to give to key employees. And we want you to hire a lot of talented people afterwards. We want you to have a larger option pool. And the way that would work is uh, in between the two slides, there would be an intermediate step where the company authorizes more shares for the option pool specifically to double the size of the option pool in this example. So before it was 15%, uh, there would be an intermediate step where they grant uh, twice the number of shares, so 2.8 million shares total for the option pool. So the option pool would then be 30% of the total ownership. The founders would be reduced to 70% because they've got to they've got to get that percentage from somewhere. Then in the next slide, after the money, the option pool would be 15%. The investors would have 50%. But the founders, because they only had 70% before the funding, would now have 35%, however you want to split that between the founders. So it is subject to negotiation where these shares percentage is going to be coming from. It might be the case that the investors are happy to have more shares authorized for the option pool without taking it from the founders, but that might come with other costs. They might say, well, uh, we don't want to put up as much money because we're essentially paying for you to authorize shares for employees. Um, and the point that I forgot to mention earlier that is now being mentioned is, was the fact that when it comes to shares, you're given an absolute number, not a percentage. So I think always just keep that in mind. And whenever you're writing an agreement, just make sure that you pay attention to the actual numbers. And then the two other type of players that you would normally see equity going and going to would be the advisors and then board members. Um, generally speaking, you know, you may have a mentor or there may be, you know, an advisory board of individuals that will help you, uh, you know, make key, uh, key communications with you know outside parties for partners or whatever it may be um, may assist you with it they may have knowledge that you don't have within your industry um, and they may be w willing to give you and provide you guidance in exchange for some equity um, you don't really see that much going to them usually you see a, a 0.1 percent or a 0.5 percent um, and per per advisor um, but again, keep in mind too, everything's subject to negotiation. Yeah, yeah. So this is typically what you would see, um, you know, if you absolutely felt so compelled to give more. I mean, I don't know if I would do that. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. But just to kind of give you some sort of a benchmark as to where this typically lands. Um, and then they typically have a shorter vesting period as well. Um, again, it's, it's, it's highly advisable to have vesting because if, you know, you're relying on their advice, uh, you may want them to stick around so then that way you can actually use them for the duration of the point that you actually need them. Um, and then, uh, and again, of course, when you're considering how much equity to, you know, they're, they're, the amount of involvement that they're going to have within the company, you know, and so the value added, you know, if they add a lot of value to the company, then it may warrant um, giving them more shares. And if they don't add that much value, then you might want to say, well, I'm not going to give you as much because you're only doing X when this individual is doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and then the directors. So if they're not an investor, uh, you might want to give them equity options, and you'll see something along the line of 0.5% uh, to 1%. Um, and in, uh, j typically, if they're um, investors, are not usually compensated. So if they're investors and directors, they're not typically comp uh, uh, compensated. They're already involved in the business activities. If they're someone that's pooled outside, um, then that's when you would usually see this come into play. Is anyone here using an LLC or a partnership? You are? Okay. So. I don't, I talk faster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, everything we said was very relevant towards corporations. With LLCs and partnerships, it's uh, a lot more complex um, to the point where there's almost no way for us to cover the how broad it is. Uh, essentially, at, when you're dealing with an LLC equity interest, you need to talk to a lawyer, really, because it's going to be so unique to the specific circumstances. And with uh, these types of entities, it's a lot more difficult to give equity interests away. It's not impossible. You can, everything that we've said 
uh, with corporations you can do with an LLC. It just becomes a lot more uh, legally uh, difficult to do, uh, and so the fees obviously increase. So you don't want to be giving away. If you're looking to give away, uh, say, a lot of employee options, equity options, or you're looking to get loads of investors, an LLC might not necessarily be the best entity type for you. Uh, obviously, if you've got a few key people that you want to keep around, a few key investors, LLC is not a problem. But each time that you need to issue equity, it's going to be a case of, oh, we've got to amend the operating agreement, for example. We've got to make sure that we uh, explain how their interest is going to work, where the profits that they're going to get is uh, are coming from, where their control rights are going to be, and outline all of that. So it's not impossible, more difficult. If there's specific questions, we can kind of direct some answers towards that, but uh, we don't want to go too much into that at this time. So we wanted to reserve a lot of time for questions uh, as much as possible. Uh, there's obviously quite a bit that we've covered, but uh, if anyone has any questions, we're happy to try and answer. Yes, please. Right, that's a good question. Uh, the ELC doesn't have an official position. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we both have our own opinions. Dan, you want to talk about crowdfunding from like? Uh, I, I w typically with the projects that we see, we don't. When it comes to to guiding individuals on how to go about crowdfunding, um, I the the. The, usually the companies are not at that stage where they're about ready to do crowdfunding. Usually it's typically startup trying to start the entity. Um, I'm sure that uh, Director Fan, if this did come across, that that would be something that would take she would take into consideration. Um, but uh, I, you know, I don't think that it would be something that we would, you know, unequivocally say no to. Um, I think again, it depends on the facts and circumstances and how complex the issue would be. And then you know the span of time that we would be required in the the man hours to actually make sure that this is done correctly, because um, that's going to involve a lot of securities laws, and um, that could it may she may say that that might be outside of the scope of the clinic. Yeah, I will say, um, don't give away equity through crowdfunding at all, please. Uh, that's going to violate loads of securities laws. If you're going to do <laughs> crowdfunding. Um, Keep it towards, say, like a Kickstarter style where it's uh, pre-order sales, for example. Don't give away a percentage of your company through crowdfunding. If, uh, don't even, you know, talk to other people about, like, offer them the opportunity without being very careful about that because even that might violate securities laws. Um, as for IC, oh, did you want to? Oh, I was going to say, I think it's in the federal law for crowdfunding. There, the Jobs Act. Yeah, there are. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> There, there is a securities exemption for crowdfunding, but I think one issue with it is that you're not allowed to, if, if you didn't meet all the requirements of the crowdfunding exemption, you don't, you can't fall back on the regular section for a two, I think, exemption. And so it's really risky to do a crowdfunding. And so I think most lawyers would advise against going down that route. And as a quick note to kind of go back to the cap table, if you did a crowdfunding round, you could imagine how complicated and how large this thing would be if you had to take into consideration all the individuals that you're all of a sudden saying, oh, I'll give you, you know, 1%, you get, you know, 2%, and so on and so forth. It just gets to be kind of crazy to try and manage that. And then again, you'll also have all these people as shareholders of your company, and you owe a duty to all of these anonymous people. So it's, I don't think it's a good idea. Now, uh, your other, the other part of your question was about ICOs. Um, so the, the law on that is kind of developing to a certain extent. I have my own opinion, uh, and it's very much in line with what the SEC is saying. Um, and they've not looked upon it too favorably. They're, they kind of have a very negative view of what's going on. Uh, but they haven't engaged in too many enforcement actions as of yet. Uh, so I would just keep an eye on that for now. There's a lot of people who are trying different things, because there's a lot of different things that can be done. And certain types of ICOs might be okay. Uh, I think if you want to look into it, there's, you know, utility tokens versus, you know, profit tokens, and there's a lot of different ways that it can be done. Uh, and some are more reasonable than others. I, I personally wouldn't recommend just jumping into an ICO. I know there's a lot of money involved in the field right now, but it's quite risky, uh, both from a 
business standpoint and from a legal standpoint. And you don't want to be liable to all these shareholders who now have full legal rights to just say, okay, give us all our money back. Yes? Are you guys offering these slides? You know, this looks like a nice, succinct overview. Uh, are we offering these slides? Uh, we can we can bring them out. It's okay. We, we're yeah. happy to we're offer these slides. I mean, so, yeah. uh, ELC info at uw.edu for the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. And we are taking your clients for the next academic spring quarter, which starts in March. March. Yeah. Or late March. Late March. And so that's, uh, the way that works is you have students who work with supervising attorneys to kind of uh, answer specific questions about your business and provide kind of an audit memo with recommendations from that. Yes, please. from how control is distributed and how profits are distributed. I mean, is it, you can design it however you want, or are there certain things that would, would be applied that really should be a corporation? Well, pass-throughs are a little bit different. Um, and C corporations have a double tax structure, right? But now if you want to go an S corporation, for instance, one of the requirements in order for you to be an S corporation is that you only have one class of stock. So the stuff that we're talking about with regard to common stock and preferred stock, VCs want to have preferred stock. They want to have rights that are superior. You know, founders are going to get common stock. Um, you know, VCs are going to get uh, preferred stock. Right then and there, you busted your S election. L election. So you, you would automatically be, uh, you'd have to fall back to a C corp. Um, w with regard to partnerships, you know, and LLCs, you know, that are choosing a partnership taxation, that's going to be a little bit different. That would probably be a route that you could go. Now, as to, it gets really complex when it comes to subchapter K of the Internal Revenue Code as to how we'll go about some of these things. And sometimes that may not be desirable. Um, you know, you're talking about issuing K-1s to individuals for investors, you know, so that may be something that they don't necessarily want that sh you should take into consideration. Um, and then what was the other aspect of? It's, um, because it was getting into decoupling and control versus profit split. Hmm. So, I mean, that's, it's entirely possible, again, like we said, to do it with an LLC or a partnership. You can still do the same kind of structure where you're giving away, say, 5% of the profits and certain control rights in an LLC. It's just that you would then, rather than just give them stock, you would have to Partnership interests. Amend, amend an agreement to kind of provide that to them. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I think you also asked about like what are the kind of like the red flags for like this is when we clearly want to C Corp. I mean, the, the clear example for when you want to C Corp is going to be like if you're going to go public at some point or you intend to, uh, if you're looking for multiple investors, uh, if you want to very easily give uh, equity to employees. Uh, if you're trying to sell the company, yeah. you know, C corporations have the op opportunity to have. Uh, um, Tax-free reorganizations. So, if somebody is is they they see you as a target, and they want to buy you, um, that's not going to necessarily be available to um, you know partnerships, for instance, where that's uh, corporations can provide that. And so, for somebody who's you know an acquiring company looking at you as a target, that may be another consideration that you want to think about as to whether you want to be you know a partnership or an LLC, if you will. Yes. There, there are tax-free benefits that come along with a corporation structure, a corporate structure, as opposed to a partnership tax structure. So taxes are, it's a huge consideration that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. They're saying, well, how do I want to, if, I mean, if I'm going to buy you, I want to make sure that I'm minimizing my tax buy. It kind of goes back to the 83B election, right? Taxes play a huge factor as to what type of entity you want to do. Um, you know, the C Corp, it's got a double, double tax structure and it's, you know, and then it's a little bit more rigid and formal and it's, you know, not always the greatest thing in the world, but it also does provide benefits that other tax regimes don't. Um, and if you're realistically, one of the, if you're, if you're looking for VC financing, C Corporation is really always advisable. It's, it's, you can do the things that you want to do. You want to give preferred stock to these VCs who want to have preferred tiers. Um, 
you know, you can, you can, you can figure out those arrangements and, and negotiate within those uh, shareholder agreements as how to go about that. It's, again, it's not to say that it's not impossible when it comes to LLCs and partnerships, but it does pose, uh, impose a, a, a far more hurdles. And it's, it's really complex, really complex. It can still engage in the same tax-free reorganizations. That's available to any corporation type. The S-Corp, C-Corp distinction is just the type of tax structure for normal income. So an S-Corp would be a pass-through entity, whereas a C-Corp has that double tax structure. But they're both able to take advantage of the tax-free reorg. But again, keep in mind, with an S-Corporation, one of the main requirements is that you can only have one class of stock. And if you are engaging in possible investing with a, a, a you know, venture capitalist, they're going to want, you know, they're going to say, well, we'll give founders common stock, but we're going to take preferred stock. Already, if that's the case and that's what they're requiring, an S corporation isn't for you because you can't keep that election. You just can't do it. Yeah. One additional. Two two notes in, in addition to everything you said. If you're having, if they're investors, they're going to want to see a C corp because that's what they're familiar with. They know, d and they're gonna wanna see probably a Delaware corporation. That's, those are the laws they, they know and that's what they wanna invest in. Um, and the second thing to note is that um, Section 1202 was recently, um, it was always like a temporary law that was renewed every year, but it became permanent. And that excludes if with a C corporation, I mean, you should look at a tax advisor, but, um, in general, the gist is if you hold your stock for five years and then sell the company, you can exclude at least 50% of the gain on a sale. It's a huge tax benefit that became permanent, and it's a it's a reason a lot of people are, are switching to a C-Corp, even as opposed to an S-Corp, if it's closely held. I actually think the amounts of $50 million just absolute right now really? was, is so what it like is. So. You can, if you have up to, yeah, if you have up to $50 million, you get that all tax-free. Um, and the other point that I just want to quickly throw out there is next week, um, the LC will be presenting on s uh, corporations specifically, so the mechanics of corporations and why you would want to do a corporation over a different type of entity. So that'll be here next week, I think, at the same time. So if anyone's interested. Uh, any other questions? Yep. So I think the standard is about 10, 10 million. million is, yeah. And there's, is, there's no point to that, really. I mean, it's very arbitrary, but just people are, you it's know, emotional. investors are, like, comfortable working with that, those numbers, and, you know, it's, well, it's the standard. Especially if, you know, they're investing potentially millions of dollars and then to say, okay, here's 20 shares, <laughs> you know. And there's going to be a lot of other players, too, so you want to make sure that you're authorizing enough shares to actually allocate to these individuals. So 10 million is usually the rule of thumb. I mean, that's a great question. I suppose you could do that as well. Uh, it just just increases the digits. Uh, th again, there's no there's no substantial reason for doing it. It is just kind of what people are more comfortable with working with, and it becomes kind of a shorthand of, oh yeah, I, I roughly own this much because I, I can just quickly look. I don't have to see how much stock each company has issued to kind of get a ballpark figure of how much they're offering me. All right. Any others? If there are no other questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Oh, don't, don't, don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Don't.